and good morning. Thank you for being here in person. It's great to be with you. In thinking about this year, what I wanted to say to you and what I wanted to share with you, I was really talking over with my staff about um, your performance during COVID. And Marilyn uh, mentioned to you all of the things that I did in the district. And you know, we'll sit down and I'll say, Superintendent, what do you want to go over with um, your peeps with? What do you want to talk about? What do you want to share with them? And I said, you know, honestly, I, I could not have done it. I don't know how they did it. Uh, but I am so super proud of them. And, and what I want to say to them is that they're heroes, actually. And to me, especially watching you in the field. And a quote came to mind from Christopher Reeve, who you probably all know, who was Superman in the movies and then uh, had that riding accident. <clears throat> and it left him paralyzed. And he said, a hero is an ordinary individual who finds the strength to persevere and endure in spite of overwhelming obstacles. Uh, and that's you all in your staff. And so uh, it inspired me to put this, this next, have my staff put this next video together for you. So we're gonna get that started uh, and I'll let you uh, watch some of the folks as we've traveled the state and some of the wonderful things that they have done as well. So again, that was you all over the past, few, uh, what is it, three years now? Has it been that long? Uh, Hardworking teachers and staff and, and truly superheroes. So it's not uh, that far of a stretch for me to cast you that way. I've been traveling the state, telling everybody that'll be the feel of the post ledge tour in your honor uh, is your superhero strength and everything that you did. Uh, matter of fact, we were joking a little bit saying that you demonstrated the abilities that could reasonably be considered superpowers like more powerful than a speeding pandemic, more resilient than a widespread staff shortage, and able to leap federal requirements in a single bound. Uh, but you really should be wearing capes, I think. Uh, and why superheroes? Someone said, why superheroes? I said, well, they make us think of excitement. They allow us to imagine the possibilities. But most of all, the people behind the mask are genuine, good hearted people making us sympathize and make us all want to be like them and idolize them. Uh, and that definitely describes everything that you did. So you will kind of see that flavor throughout the post ledge tour today. Uh, and now you know why. Uh, and of course, the teacher in me just couldn't resist as well. But that's why I'm also glad that this year's post legislative tour marks the end of a session that was not only very reasonable in length, if you think about last year's, but also accomplished a great deal for Idaho schools. 
Believe it or not, this past session was actually one of my favorites uh, because we did get to see historic levels of investments in Idaho's public schools. Anything from improving teacher pay uh, to boosting our early literacy and also uh, the resolution on the civic standards and uh, replacing the controversial common core standards in English language arts and math. And I'll get into the reasoning behind those two and later on as I'm talking to you about that. Uh, but we did have a lot of strong support on the English language arts and math standards. And I wanna let you know that that was, um, it was time. It was not for just political reasons. I don't know if you know, but I'm talking to the, I'm preaching to the choir here. I always say, you know, we're supposed to review the standards every five years. So it was time uh, for us to get that work done so that conversation can get out of your way so that you can do your job. And it was a lot of educators and uh, your representation, ISBA, IASA, a lot of people from the education community sat on those groups and they did the work uh, and it, it got a lot of support. So I'm, I'm excited about that. You will see a significant increase in your uh, early literacy funding from 26 million to be exact to 72.8 million. Uh, and that opens up your options and opportunities for your districts uh, for your uh, early literacy intervention programs uh, to meet your local needs. I was also happy to see that there was an economically disadvantaged or at-risk component to that as a former building principal in a building that was uh, set over 70% poverty, and then the rest of them were English language learners. Um, I get the, the local needs and you having to tailor those interventions to the types of students that you have. I wanna thank all of you who in this room, and of course my staff who worked closely with our lawmakers uh, to get this through uh, and find a path forward that all of our kids are on grade level by the end of third grade. I also, as you know, was a third grade teacher for 11 years. So that is really personal to me and near and dear to my heart that our kids are on grade level by third grade because uh, how many of you in here know that when they showed up in my classroom and they were not able to read uh, and the gap was this big, the probability of me closing that, slim to none. I knew it was going to be a struggle all year long for those students. So uh, that is something I really want to continue to work on across our state. And while we see that that bill specifically um, did not provide for all day or full day kindergarten, many of you did find ways to get that accomplished, and I'm happy about that. Uh, and you've announced that you have many more uh, interesting and innovative programs. Uh, and I will continue to advocate for local control and flexibility around those dollars so that you can do that. Uh, I had an opportunity to substitute back in October um, and I was slinking out of the building at three o'clock when the bell rang because I was exhausted, but I, it was first and second grade, by the way. Um, and I was walking through the gym at the end of the day in these, no less. Um, and I saw hardworking staff after everything that happened, still giving it up at the end of the day, their time and effort and helping kids close those gaps. So I know that everybody is working super hard. Uh, also something else that I'm excited about, and I know that the word bonus kind of is a little sticking point for you all, so I'll be careful using that word, but I did ask for thousand dollar bonuses for educators, and that's happening as we speak. And um, you'll have a discussion later on with my staff about that. Um, but we do need to thank the legislature for funding those bonuses and then for all school staff too. Because again, when I walked to the gym at the end of the day after substitute te teaching, it was the classified staff that was in there. So, um, you know, huge kudos to them. Cause again, like I said, I couldn't have done it. I was tired. I was in a recliner at 7.30 that night thinking that I was watching TV and the next thing I know, my husband's elbowing me in the ribs. Babe, babe, you're soaring. You know, you got to go to bed, get up, go to bed because you have to get up and do it all over, do it all over again, substituting in second grade tomorrow. So I understand my point is the importance of our classified staff and all of the work that they do to help us be successful. One of my 
goals was to increase their salary. And I'm thrilled for the next school year that classified staff and administrators too uh, are getting a 7% pay increase. I don't know if you know this, but I am also chairwoman for Idaho School for the Deaf and the Blind. So not only was I your superintendent during the pandemic, I was also a school board member during the pandemic, which was a very interesting ride, is all I'm going to say. Um, that Those are some of your most at-risk kids across the state of Idaho. And if you think about it, they have to touch and feel everything. They're blind and they're deaf. So they touch and feel everything all day long. And we were not to touch and feel everything all day long. We were having to mask up where they read lips. We were having to clean surfaces. Uh, they stay on campus, a lot of them, in close quarters in a set of cottages. They fly out and go home on Friday because some of them are from up here. So that was quite the challenge. My point is it was an honor to get to give my superintendent a 7% increase for all of his hard work and having to jump through the hoops for the federal funding for the plan that he had to bring to us and us all here, here, bless it, right? And then on top of it, having a staffing shortage and having to shut down and what am I gonna do with these kids who showed up on Monday on a plane and now we're having to close, how am I gonna get them through the airport? So we had a lot of challenges too. Uh, in addition, Moving on, I want to say that the legislature fully funded the career ladder uh, for, fiscal year, for fiscal year 2023 and an additional $36.5 million in edu additional educator compensation. Again, I'm a teacher, so that was really important to me. All in all, uh, this next school year's investment uh, in public education is huge. It's a general fund appropriation of $2.3 billion dollars for 2022-2023 year up uh, more than 256 million from the state's general fund that was set a year ago. So those are huge historic investments. Along with the much needed funding this session for education, I had new respect for um, our system of government. And I'm not talking about the fact that I'm the executive branch and then there's the legislative branch and the judicial branch. I'm talking about my student advisory council and you all have kids from your district that serve on that council. I actually got to get out and visit a couple, well, one of them yesterday. There's 13 kiddos in grades four through 12 all over the state. Uh, and many, like I said, many of you have these kids in your district. They are amazing, absolutely amazing. And they're a product of you and the education that they're getting. They had the opportunity to meet with the governor they attended education committee meetings. They conducted a mock legislative session. I think they were a little more well-behaved, um, just saying. Two of them, a uh, ninth grader, Audrey Harmon, Harmon from Idaho Falls, and a Coeur d'Alene student, uh, Bridget McNamee, actually uh, testified during an actual legislative hearing advocating for bills that now are a law. Uh, and I have just continued to be amazed uh, at these students who stepped up to really make a difference across our state. They too are superheroes and give me a lot of hope uh, for what's going on in our schools across our state. Uh, along with the student advisory council meetings that I had, I had the opportunity to get out if you didn't see and visit classrooms a lot. And I specifically went to government classes and social studies classes so that I could see what was being taught for myself. And uh, I co-sponsored a resolution for the civic standards. Uh, I saw what I thought I was gonna see, the Declaration of Independence being taught, the Constitution being taught. And um, I was encouraged everywhere I went uh, with the conversations that I heard in our classrooms. The civic standards are not going to add anything to your teacher's plates. I am a teacher and I think their head is going to explode if we give them one more thing to do, right? But the reason behind that was for a couple of things. I am a curriculum director. I can sniff a standard from a mile away. I know where they all are. I know what we teach 
And I know for a fact, a parent is not going to go to page 56, line three, letter C, and look up civics. So, and what's in kindergarten? Then you have to do it again in first grade. Then you have to do it again in second grade. So what happens when they can't find what's being taught in civics? They fill in the blank, they make it up, yeah. So CRT must be real, right? So what we did is we pulled out those standards and put them in a nice neat little document, a one-stop shop. So there's no more mystery around what is being taught. You can go right to my website, you can click on it and you can go right down the list, kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade and see what's being taught. And then I can say, what in there bothers you? So that was the reason behind it. Now they're part of a review that will be coming up soon just as part of the regular cycle. So there will be teachers at the table looking at that again. The other thing we're going to do that with is our financial literacy standards, because now there's another conversation right now going on around the state that our kids have no idea how to balance a checkbook, that we're not teaching them any common sense, that they don't know what they're doing. But I don't know about you, but one, those lie in the economic standards, right? So we are teaching that. And number two, I have a 21 year old that still lives in my house that goes to the University of Idaho. And I cannot tell you when I look at him and ask him about balancing a checkbook, do you know what he does? Rolls his eyes and says, who in the world still balances a checkbook? Do you have one of these? And he holds up his cell phone and says, if I wanna know what's in my bank account, this is real time right here, mom. I'm not gonna balance a checkbook, that's old school. So you will see me do that again. and. Um, and then, you know, move on about having more conversations about, we actually got a B, we were rated a B as in boy for our financial literacy standards nationally. So if we want to get to an A, uh, what we need to talk about moving forward is talk about credit scores and have kids understand their credit scores and talk about their financial worth, meaning when you get a job, what could your contribution to your household be? Well, yeah, those are some pretty interesting conversations. We have a lot of partners around the state that would like to help. Um, so that was what the rating we got. So I, I find it hard to believe that we're not teaching financial literacy in our state. Uh, another thing my student advisory council told me was they are tired of being talked about as if they are don't exist and that everybody talks around them and that there's a lot of negativity about how they're nothing but failures and they're last for everything. Um, and again, this year you heard some lawmakers claim loudly that there's no progress in our student achievement and that they are, quote, tired of paying for failure. Well, that kind of rhetoric is a huge disservice to our students and our parents, our educators and our schools and our staff. I know no business that has survived by banging its people over the head, one, and two, we're not seeing this influx of people moving to Idaho because we're awful. I don't think anybody believes that we have a horrific school system. Do we have some work to do? Yes. Are we last for everything? No. So I'm gonna give you some pretty interesting statistics, but we do have an F in something and we are last for something, but you probably already know what that is, right? What is it? Funny, funny. yeah, funny. <laughs> so here is the truth about our kiddos with a capital T for truth. Our students score above their peers in neighboring states across the country on our nationally normed assessments, especially the NAEP. That's the most trusted assessment in the country right now and our kiddos are outperforming a lot of their peers, especially in fourth grade reading. Uh, Idaho schools have held their own during the pandemic. Many of the states that are around us saw some pretty huge slide backs during the pandemic and we did not. I had the pleasure of sitting at a table with some folks who were hired to look at our data during the pandemic and um, they were pretty excited about uh, the progress that we made. Not to say we didn't have some slide backs. I'm going to talk to you about that in a minute. But we didn't see the slide backs that, that the rest of the nation did. Why? Because we were open most of the time. Uh, we had that one small stint when the whole thing started. Then we closed down. What was that? Around spring break? 
uh, and then we were primarily open for the rest of the time, unlike the rest of the nation. So uh, you all, again, are true superheroes because that, that's some superhero stuff. To be able to see other states sit at the table with me and in awe of our data was, was pretty exciting. <laughs> Uh, again, uh, we were ranked an F uh, for funding by Education Week's 2021 study, bless you, of education quality nationwide. Um, our, pu per, our per pupil spending got an F. Uh, again, but in terms of student achievement, uh, we went from 31st to 17th in the nation for achievement. We are fifth in the nation for college and career ready. We are number one in the nation for college credits earned while still in high school. And these are all uh, outside statistics. They are not mine, they are third parties. We have a flyer if you'd like to take a copy of that with you. All of that has been documented so somebody can't um, take you to task on that if you if you want a copy of it. Uh, but um, Although we are doing much better than a lot of our fellow states, of course, you know probably where we need to do a little bit better. And these kids had gaps before the pandemic. I get it. But their gaps got bigger. And who are they? Our special populations, our English language learners, our special uh, our poverty population. So we did see uh, a lot of those gaps grow. So I appreciate you um, using your COVID relief dollars wisely uh, for extra doses of tutoring, intervention, after school programs uh, to help close those gaps for those students. Um, so, what's on the horizon as we move forward? We need to make sure that public schools are the number one choice for our families across the state. We have to continue to reinforce the value of our public schools. Uh, we have to be transparent, like I did with the civic standards, like we're doing with the financial literacy standards. And we have to listen to parents' concerns and requests and take them seriously. And I know that you all, for the most part, are doing that. But I, um, I had a parent, a parent group talk to me about vote technical education. And we haven't called it votech for many, many years because we thought that that was um, doing a disservice to our kids. It kind of was um, meant a lesser education, right? So we changed it. I thought about this. We changed it three times the name of Vote Technical Education. Now it's CTE, Career Technical Education. And parents think we're not offering CTE classes. So we have some work to do in correcting some of that thinking. And that's where that comes from. Not the fact that you did anything wrong. It was our attempt to have a better conversation around career technical education and its value. And we lost people along the way when we did that. So um, parents also have been talking to me as I've been traveling the state about parental involvement. And the nice thing that they said is they do not wanna go around you, which really made me happy. I'm not interested in going around my school district. I just want another place that I can look for information, superintendent. And I'm not interested in some silly top-down piece of legislation that gives me these rights, which also made me very happy. I know that my rights are embedded in the system. Here's the best part, kind of made me giggle. I forget how to engage. So they asked me for a practical set of strategies to help get re-engaged in schools. And I'm going to release a parent toolkit the first week of May to help them with that. Things like advanced opportunities, more information around that, who they can go talk to in their district, where they can get that information. So K-3 will, will be a continued focus on literacy. Anytime you get more funding, unfortunately there will be more strings attached and the accountability will get bigger, but I have no doubt that you will step up to that a challenge and I say unfortunately we don't get a blank check. I wish we did. Um, again, I cannot emphasize enough how important it is that you're using evidence-based strategies uh, to work with your students to close those achievement gaps. Um, and one other issue that we're all facing that you're very well aware of um, came forward during this session, it got a lot of attention because the Office of Performance and Evaluation commissioned their report on our aging buildings. And um, 77 school districts participated in that report. 
And that survey ranked more than half of our buildings between 55, 58 and 60% of them as either fair or in poor condition. And the report estimates that it would take $847 million to get all of our buildings back up to speed or in uh, good condition. And um, I was the building principal who every time it rained, out came the buckets, right? And I would stand in the hallway as we did and watch the kids go to music and PE. And this is what I would see as they walked by over the bucket, right? And then flick each other with the water. And But that made me really uncomfortable because I stood there and watched it and I said, the kids don't care. They're used to it. They should not be used to buckets all over the building every time it rained. What message were we sending them that you can, you need to do better on your achievement, but we don't really care if you're getting wet while you're walking to PE or music. I also, during an ISAT test, had the tiles in the ceiling collapse while the kids were taking the test. Now, we ran a levy to fix that. So it's no surprise that the number of districts with supplemental levies had increased in this report as well, going from 57 in 2006 to 92 districts in 2020. And that was probably, my district was probably part of that report, I would imagine. Part of that increase can be explained by the reduction in discretionary funds too uh, that districts received uh, during that time period. So we rank at the bottom, my point is uh, for funding, in general and for funding our school building maintenance again. So no surprise there. I was hoping when we first started having those conversations around the funding formula that we might see a fix come forward out of there, but we weren't able to get that accomplished. And then uh, the pandemic hit. So as your state superintendent, I don't know if you know this, I also sit on the land board of commissioners and I wanna work on some ways to look at our endowment funds to help address the needed improvements in K-12 educational buildings. Uh, the endowment board already directs millions of dollars uh, from our public land to help public schools and our um, disbursement is already set next year at $61 million. So I would love to see some of that money uh, get used to improve the structures that our kids learn in. Um, I want kids to know that we do value them, that we, do care about the environment that we're in and that they are in and it's not just achievement. And we all know if we've been trained in the culture of poverty that what your community looks like means a lot to the kids that are in that community. So um, we need to focus on what we all do every day to make sure our kids feel that they're valued and supported. And that's one of the things we need to continue to focus on. Uh, I appreciate the governor and the legislature making education a priority once again this year. And my staff's about to update you on some of those changes uh, that you will uh, find in your district from some of those laws. I know there are some things that are under your skin. I am well aware of that and we're doing the best that we can to uh, fix some of those things. And I know bonuses happens to be one of them. I know the insurance is expensive. I am well aware of all of that uh, and we'll do everything we can. I don't always win every single battle. I don't know if you've noticed that, but we win a lot, a lot more than you think. So <coughs> with that, I wanna congratulate you as I close and thank you for everything that you do. Uh, you make me proud to call myself your superintendent, but most importantly, proud to say that I'm an educator in this state. Uh, I was a principal and a vice principal, all those things Marilyn talked about. I've been there, I've done that, I walked in your shoes. Uh, so you, you do a nice job and you have a lot to be proud of. Mr. Rogers said it best. He said, when I was very young, most of my childhood heroes wore capes and they flew through the air and picked up buildings with one arm in a single bound. Uh, they were spectacular and they got a lot of attention, but as I grew, my heroes changed. And so now I can honestly say that anyone who does anything to help a child is a hero to me. 
So thank you. All right, you're going to heave a sigh of relief here that I am not going to cover every single education related bill uh, that came before the legislature this year. What I am going to do is cover a few topics, and some of these are things we don't normally talk about, but they were important uh, this session. So I'm going to talk a little bit about supplemental appropriations, uh, the bonuses. There's a little bit of a wrinkle there that we need to make you aware of. Uh, the insurance funding, although I won't cover that in depth, and I'm not going to answer your questions because we do have Jennifer Pike with the Office of Group Insurance, who will be here with, uh, with us later today to talk to you about that and answer questions. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the literacy intervention, the content standards, and enrollment funding. And there were some disappointments in this session, for sure. Uh, as the superintendent, I think, mentioned, you know, we all hoped we'd have a true full-day kindergarten bill, uh, and that didn't happen. But the great news was the additional literacy intervention funding and just the overall um, huge funding boost to K through 12 education this year. So uh, it took a lot of effort on the part of your associations and, and uh, those who represent all of the stakeholder groups, as well as uh, our legislators who really are, I joke about them, but um, they are people with good intentions who uh, work very hard, not just during the session, but all year round. Uh, and we do really have some great folks uh, right now chairing our germane committees and, and really doing the best they can for all of you and, and to support you. So why do I need to talk about supplemental appropriations? The big conversation we all had last year was that through intent language, uh, the legislature had uh, actually prohibited withdrawals from the Public Education Stabilization Fund. There are variances in the public schools budget every year because the budget's based on estimates. And because we don't know, and you all don't know until the year's closed out, exactly what your numbers are. And we spend a lot of time trying to help our legislative friends understand that. Uh, but especially for those big line items like salaries, uh, even things like transportation, uh, we will have big variances. And typically those come out of PISA. That was not the case for this year. Uh, so what the uh, Appropriations Committee asked of the department and the superintendent at their October meeting was to submit supplemental appropriation requests for known shortfalls. And so the superintendent did that at the end of October. And again, you know, for these big uh, for these big line items. And I put IDLA up there because a lot of people don't understand that when uh, these other line items uh, fluctuate, their, uh, their appropriation does as well. We had an influx of child nutrition funds that required a supplemental uh, request. And then the additional one-time costs for uh, enrollment funding for the current fiscal year. The good news was that the governor recommended all of them and they were all approved by the legislature. Uh, Julie Oberly and I were in a meeting with the governor's staff last week. Was that last week? I don't know. Yes, it was last week. It's all a blur. Uh, and uh, they told us that uh, as far as they were aware, that was the new normal. That the Public Education Stabilization Fund, even though it was created uh, to deal with these budget variances, uh, was uh, going to be treated moving forward as a rainy day fund. And so uh, the superintendent will continue to submit supplemental requests uh, for known shortfalls moving forward to make sure that you're all kept whole. And, and the good news is we feel that the supplementals that were approved uh, will do that for uh, this current fiscal year. The teacher bonuses, uh, I think, were a real signal to all of you uh, how much the governor and the legislature supports you uh, and your staff. The superintendent sent a letter to Governor Little in November and asked if he would consider using the state's uh, American Rescue Plan Act money to do these bonuses. The governor included that in his recommendation. And then the legislature actually approved bonuses for all uh, of your staff. And I think, again, really strong signal of support. The wrinkle here is that these monies come through the US Treasury Department, not through the US Education Department. And uh, those guidelines uh, require that these funds be used for what they call premium pay. And so as you draw this money down through the GRA, we're asking you to use that terminology, premium pay. Uh, and you'll hear Karen and Julie reiterate this as well, uh, so that we are uh, meeting those requirements that our federal partners have um, 
uh, have requested. I also just want to point out that every year the superintendent uh, requests a significant increase to classified staff uh, salary appropriation. And uh, a lot of years, what happens is they simply get, and you all simply get the CEC. And a lot of years that's 2%, 3%, some good years it's 5%. The really great news this year is that that was 7%. And so we hope that that's going to help. Uh, we know how difficult it is for you to uh, attract and then keep uh, those staff. So hopefully uh, that will go some way to helping with that. I'm going to cover this very quickly at just a high level, but want you to be aware that there were two, two things that happened here. House Bill 443 created a fund with $75.5 million of general fund to allow you to buy into the state health and, well, medical and dental health insurance uh, program. Uh, and those funds are available to you to opt in and to use for two years. I will tell you that we've had discussions with the governor's office and the legislative services office about whether or not there would be consideration to extending that time frame uh, to three or four years if uh, you all needed more time to see how it's playing out for uh, some of your uh, neighboring districts. And the answer we got was yes, uh, we, we would consider extending that. I think they really wanna see uh, how many districts and charters are available or, or are able to initially opt into this, how it works for them. And they realize two years is not, uh, not a lot of time for you all to assess whether or not it would work for you. Um, I also just wanna point out that uh, this was the bill that repealed the leadership premiums uh, and the reason for that repeal was so, so that those funds could be used to augment the ongoing uh, increase for the health insurance line item, which I'll get to next. But before I leave this, just want you to know that these funds for the opt-in will be on a first come first served basis and they can't be used for any other purpose. So at the end of whatever the time frame is uh, for these funds, uh, whatever's unused will revert to PSIF. The other thing that happened with the insurance funding was through House Bill 797, and this increased the distribution factor for the health insurance line item in discretionary. And it actually created much more of a, a separate line item for this health insurance. In the past, while it's been separate in the budget, it's all been ultimately discretionary. Uh, I also wanna just point out as we go through here, some of the new requirements uh, that are attached to some of these changes. So House Bill 797 requires a new report that's due not to the department, but to uh, legislative services and the Division of Financial Management by December 1st. They want to see what was appropriated to you and how you spent that money. They also want to see your health insurance plans. Um, there was a companion bill or another bill that was working its way through the process that would have required that you spend 90% of that line items appropriation on health insurance benefits. That did not pass. There was also a move to try to include uh, similar intent language in the appropriations bill. That also uh, did not end up in the final bill. However, what did end up in there was this new requirement for reporting. And the message, and, and Julie's gonna reiterate this as well, the message is they want to see that you're spending the vast majority of these funds for health insurance benefits for your employees. Uh, and so just a, just a caution there, and that's why they're requiring these reports. There's always trade-offs in the legislative process. Some call them compromises, I don't know. We try, we try our best uh, to make sure that we're getting to a good outcome. I'm not gonna cover this in depth because both Elena um, and Julie will cover it in more detail in terms of the formula. Uh, but I do want you to know how very hard many, many people worked during this session to try to get a bill that everybody could, uh, could agree to. Uh, there were several iterations of a full day kindergarten bill. Um, we couldn't ultimately uh, get the germane committees there. Uh, and then there were several iterations of a literacy intervention bill. Um, and there were some that would have prohibit, prohibited your using this money for full day kindergarten. There were some uh, drafts that would have 
prohibited you from running supplemental levies to help augment full day kindergarten. And again, through a lot of fine efforts by a lot of people, uh, we were able to get to a bill where the additional money was available without a lot of those restrictions. Uh, and so please thank your, um, your legislators who sit on House or Senate education committees because um, you know, I, I can't even describe, I mean, Julie and I go to so many, <laughs> so many meetings uh, early morning, late in the, late in the day, um, and have so many conversations about these things, as do many, many others, to try to get to a good outcome for, for all of you. Um, so we do feel like we got there. It's not perfect, uh, but uh, I do want to point out that, again, there was a trade-off here, and that is that there are some new uh, reporting requirements around your supplemental levies. Uh, and so please read uh, those bills very carefully because they are watching uh, what you're doing there. And I'll, I'll, I have a couple of slides here that go over that. But before I do that, I just want to um, also point out that House Bill 790 uh, has two buckets of funding, a 50-50, and the second 50% has a waiting for your students who are economically disadvantaged. Um, Again, lots of conversation around what this formula looked like and the challenges it might present to you. Uh, and the challenge is that for the last two years under all of the US Department of Agriculture waivers, all students uh, have had access to free meals, which meant that all we have in IC currently for the last two years is direct certification or students who are not eligible. Uh, we don't have information from most of you around free and reduced lunch via an, a free and reduced lunch application or an income survey. We know it's a heavy lift, we know time is short, but our legislative sponsors were adamant that we not use 2019 data and that we not use proxy data, but that you all do your best to get us this information around uh, your economically disadvantaged <coughs> students. And honestly, we just wanna make sure that you get all of the literacy intervention funding uh, that you should. And so we're just asking that you do your best. Uh, we know it's a heavy lift. If there's anything that we can do to help, we will uh, be happy to do that. But we're asking for you to gather that and then to include it in your May and end of year IC uploads. Make sure you're including it end of year as well because we wanna make sure that that end of year doesn't overwrite the May upload. All of this, all of these codes and these fields are already in IC. It's just that, again, for the last two years, we don't have most of this data. So these are the codes uh, and the categories. And again, help us uh, by doing your best. So the new supplemental levy reporting requirements, again, I would really uh, suggest you read this closely. I tried to bold face some of the, uh, the high level points here, uh, but basically uh, a lot more transparency around the levies that you're running and what you intend to use those funds for. And so there's actually two new sections of code. There's, um, there's 33802B, which is up here on the screen. And then there's 33802C. Uh, and again, that was the trade-off here to make sure that um, you know, we, we gave you or you had as, as much flexibility as possible. We have been asked, so uh, does that mean we, we can use these literacy intervention funds for, uh, to, to help fund full day kindergarten? Yes, there is nothing in House Bill 790 that says that you cannot do that. So I wanna make that very clear for everybody. A companion piece with respect to literacy was the dyslexia bill. Elena is going to cover this in a lot more detail, but I just want to let you know that contrary to what you may have heard or read, the department has been working on dyslexia for several years. Both Elena and I served on the uh, review committee to update the comprehensive literacy plan, uh, which took two years, Elena. Uh, with a lot of stakeholders, uh, a lot of advocacy groups, and dyslexia was a prominent discussion point in that process. And it is called out specifically in the comprehensive literacy plan that was approved by the Board of Education in December of 2020. Along with that, Elaine has been working uh, for the last couple of years on the SMART training. We hope that 
that you have staff participating in the SMART training. Uh, she's going to talk more about that, but that does include training on dyslexia. Uh, the superintendent mentioned her student advisory council and their advocacy. When she met with them for the very first time in September, uh, several of them said, uh, you know, we want to learn more about dyslexia. We have siblings, we have peers and friends who have uh, other family members who have dyslexia. We're interested in learning more and seeing what we can do to help. And so uh, they had presentations and then they said, well, you know what Idaho really lacks is a statute or a law that, that calls this out. And so uh, we started working with legislators uh, last fall on a bill. Uh, there actually ended up being three bills that uh, came out during this session, but the one that eventually passed was House Bill 731. And our advocacy for this bill was around A, getting something passed uh, to provide more support for these kids and more training for our teachers uh, and uh, all of your staff, but two, was also to make sure that it was realistic for you all. And one of the first bills that came out had some timeframes and some training requirements that we knew would be a really heavy lift for you all to, uh, to meet. And so uh, through the process uh, and with the help of the committee chairs and vice chairs, we were able to get to uh, a good point with House Bill 731. And Elena will talk more about that. We also don't talk much about concurrent resolutions, but there were a couple this year that were important. Uh, House Concurrent Resolutions 39 was the one that rejected the math, science, and English language arts content standards. And House Bill, or I'm sorry, House Concurrent Resolution 45 rejected the initial standards for certification of school personnel. Um, Todd's going to talk more about uh, these, and so is Bethany. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these, but I, I just want to say that. Um, I personally uh, have been in this arena for quite some time, and I have not attended a public meeting uh, in the last 10 years that was not in some way hijacked by the debate over Common Core. And the legislature was adamant uh, three years ago uh, that we address it and that we get past it and that we give you all more stability around what the content standards were going to be. And so uh, they asked the superintendent, the state board, the governor's office to please commence a process. Todd's gonna talk a little bit more about that, but uh, they felt very strongly about this. They felt strongly enough about it to reject the standards and to um, then put into place new standards, which was uh, House Bill 716. Uh, and Todd will talk a little bit more about this, but um, I just want you all to know that um, while it does cause um, it does cause more work in terms of you all learning and your staff learning what the changes are, I want you to know that the department and Todd's team we're all there to support that work. Uh, we're all there to make that as easy for all of you as possible. Uh, and the next conversation is going to be around you know what what happens with the assessment uh, and. Um, Stay tuned is what I will say, but the companion piece for us to House Bill 716 was a trailer bill to fund the alignment study so that we could determine or the experts could determine uh, how the new standards align to the current ISAP. I'll tell you there are two camps in the legislature with respect to a path forward on the assessment. I think that both the current uh, House and Senate Ad Committee chairs and vice chairs uh, would like us to keep uh, the same assessment. They know that we will need to make some modifications based on the new content standards because some of them moved from one grade level to the next. Um, some of them were removed. And so there will need to be changes to the assessment. I would say there's another camp that uh, believes that we should go in a different direction. And so the alignment study that is funded through this trailer bill. Uh, we're starting actually you know, as we speak. It will take about a year. And so it's gonna take some time to determine uh, you know, what a path forward is and what the cost will be. And that was a big question that everybody had. All I can tell you is it depends. It depends on what policymakers decide in terms of the direction they wanna go and what kind of changes would need to be made to the um, existing assessment and whether or not uh, policymakers decide to stay with that new assessment. And so we, we will do our best to keep everybody updated on that process. 
uh, I would expect that that conversation will be one uh, that will be a focus uh, over the next two sessions. I do just want to point out House Bill 650, which uh, deals with curriculum materials adoption. Um, this changes the may back to a shall, uh, that you shall have a committee. But again, through a lot of uh, discussions and an amendment process on the Senate side, this no longer says you have to have six <laughs> parents. It doesn't prescribe an exact number of, of the types of committee members you have to have. So it gives you a lot more flexibility here uh, and uh, was, was a, a compromise. I'm going to circle back to the House Concurrent Resolution 45 because in addition to rejecting the certification standards, um, this resolution also did a couple of other things. Uh, the legislature has had conversation for three or four years now about removing the requirement that seniors take math. And they rejected that part of the omnibus rulemaking from the State Board of Education. So that requirement is no longer in place. On the flip side, that rulemaking uh, would have removed the surveys that you currently do as part of the accountability framework and would have replaced them with chronic absenteeism. Uh, the legislature actually said, we want the, our districts and charters to continue to do those surveys. We want to understand and know how they are uh, communicating with and engaging with their students, uh, parents, and teachers. So they asked the State Board of Education through rulemaking this next year to put those back in. Uh, the superintendent and I were in a meeting a couple of weeks ago with state board members and staff, and it is their intent to uh, reinstate those surveys in administrative rule over the course of this next year. Uh, they do, <coughs> however, plan to add chronic absenteeism to the federal accountability framework. So there's two things going on there. So we'll, we'll get more information to you about that, um, but wanted you to be aware of that. They also, um, the, the state board through the omnibus rulemaking took out the language around teacher endorsements and the legislature said, we want visibility to that. We wanna see that language. We wanna know what changes are being made. Uh, and so please put that language back into rulemaking this next, uh, this next cycle. And so we would expect that that those will appear back in rule uh, at some point soon. Um, the civic standards, the superintendent already talked about uh, and talked about doing uh, something similar with the financial literacy standards. I'll just tell you that during the process of reviewing the content standards, um, parents and other com community members and patrons who were on those committees said, you know, we understand that the standards are a guide for teachers on what to teach kids and what kids need to know and be able to do. However, as parents and patrons and community members, we would really like to know what our kids are learning. And so they asked us for a guide, if you will. So a, a user guide or a parent guide around the standards. And so um, this was sort of step one, the financial literacy piece will be step two, because what parents were really asking us is, okay, I wanna know what my kindergarten student learning across the, the content areas. I want to know what my sophomores learning across the content areas. And so, um, you know, we told them that we would start working on that and, and that's what we are doing. I'm just going to point this out. Bethany will talk about it a little bit more, but I do want you to know that one of the themes that we're certainly seeing is that legislators want you to have more flexibility uh, and they want you to have um, uh, more tools in order to meet your staffing challenges uh, and especially really critical ones like counselors. And so we hope that uh, that this will be helpful to you. I'm pointing out House Bill 685, uh, just so that you know, for the sake of your students, that this particular uh, scholarship was very undersubscribed in the past because it required that a matching scholarship be merit-based. And I think we all know students who get a that, you know, they might get a Kiwanis scholarship or they might get a rodeo scholarship uh, that's not necessarily merit-based. And so there were a lot of students who didn't qualify for this because of that. The language in this bill changes that so that it's simply a matching scholarship. So we would expect a lot more students will be eligible. Uh, so please, you know, make sure your counselors know this and, and get that information out to your students. It is, um, it is capped. There are um, amounts that, they're, that the students are eligible for based on the number of uh, post-secondary credits they earn. Uh, and this line item or this 
funding comes out of the advanced opportunities line item uh, up to $2 million. So we'll see how this plays out and, and how uh, many more students are able to take advantage of that scholarship. So uh, House Bill 723 was um, certainly a disappointment uh, for a lot of us. Um, I, I worked on Governor Otter's task force and um, am well aware that the recommendation to shift to enrollment funding uh, is now almost 10 years uh, on and we've had, uh, we had a three-year interim committee uh, and House Bill 723 actually would have created yet another committee to talk about, uh, to talk about this issue. Uh, and, and we were told that that was one of the reasons why this bill was, was vetoed. I think that, you know, there's certainly obviously legislative support to move to enrollment funding, but uh, there, were, there were a lot of reasons I think why um, this bill ultimately uh, was not put, uh, was not enacted. The good news is that the trailer bill to fund enrollment for next fiscal year was signed by the governor. So the funding is there. And the state board meeting that's happening uh, today and tomorrow, just across the street, uh, we have been assured uh, that the agenda item around a, a new temporary rule uh, to close out the rest of this fiscal year and to carry through next fiscal year will be approved. And Julie's gonna tell you you know, that with great tact and diplomacy, she uh, got uh, reassurance that that was going to happen. So that's the good news uh, of, um, of House Bill 723 and, and the fallout there. I'm not gonna cover this in detail either because Bethany and Julie will. However, um, I do just wanna let you know that the legislative process, some people call it sausage making, um, if you've been involved at any level, uh, what I can, what, what you know and what I can tell you is that um, there are bills that are complicated. There are bills that get rewritten and redrafted numerous times that get reintroduced as whole new bills. Um, and there are points in the process where things get dropped and not added back in again. And that happened with House Bill 805. Um, Julie and her staff and I started working with Senator Dan Nelson last summer uh, on this bill. Uh, and I think the great news is they heard you, they heard your pleas to, to have a better way to place out-of-state out teachers on the career ladder. Uh, we worked really hard to get it right, but in the bill drafting process, the language that would have made this um, uh, in place this year was dropped and not added back in. And so the good news is this is in place moving forward July 1. It's not in place for the current year. That doesn't mean they can't go back and revisit it. But And we're, we're not quite sure when in the process that occurred. But when the bill hit committee, we weren't uh, surprised by that. So. Um, Todd's going to cover this one, this self-directed loan <laughs> bill. I just want you to know that this was Senator Thane's bill, and he tried several times uh, to get this through and was successful uh, this, uh, this legislative session. It does have a new reporting requirement for you that you report the number of self-directed learners. Uh, and I will say that this is another theme that we're seeing is uh, they also want parents and students to have more options uh, and more flexibility. I think that's perhaps part of a byproduct of, of COVID where, you know, uh, parents and families found out that there were different ways for their kids to learn and, and they were successful. And in fact, uh, in, in some ways, those were, uh, you know, better for them. So we know that this will be a challenge. We'll help you with it uh, as much as we can. I'm just mentioning Senate Bill 1290. It will be administered by the State Board of Education uh, as part of their scholarship programs. Um, but again, efforts to give you more tools. Uh, and I do want to give a lot of credit to Senator Janie Ward Engelking and Representative Sally Toon, uh, who I think, I don't know, this might have been the fifth try uh, to get this bill through and they were successful this year. So um, kudos to them. Uh, and, you know, they really do care about, um, about you and, and your uh, challenges with staffing and, and they care about our teachers. We did get through the session without another bill on CRT or diversity, equity, and inclusion that had uh, punitive measures in it. 
Uh, but we got this concurrent resolution. Uh, I would invite you to read it. What I will tell you is that um, this conversation uh, has not gone away. Uh, we don't believe that it will <laughs> uh, anytime soon. Uh, so, you know, just be aware that there are certainly lots of folks still talking uh, about CRT and about social emotional learning. Uh, and we do everything that we can to help educate them. Uh, but um, I don't know if you have been following, but Florida just uh, banned or prohibited the use of 40% of their math textbooks because they believe they contain CRT and indoctrination or and or elements of Common Core. So, uh, you know, stay tuned again. We do our best to make sure that uh, harm is not done. And I'm just really quickly going to circle back to PSEF because uh, I just want to reiterate that we will continue, the superintendent will continue to ask for supplementals where we know there's going to be shortfalls. Uh, and having been told that that's the new normal, we would uh, assume moving forward that those will be supported uh, so that you are kept whole with budget variances. I'll just point out the transfers to PSIF for both this fiscal year and next, which brings us very close to the statutory maximum uh, for that stabilization fund. There were a lot of things that didn't pass to the vast relief of most of that, most of us. Uh, there were some disappointments and things we would have liked to have seen pass. Uh, this is not an exhaustive list of, of things that didn't pass, but um, as with most election years, uh, there was a lot introduced, but uh, they focused on some very um, key things, which was good. So what's ahead? Uh, there could be 40 to 50% uh, turnover in the legislature, which means that we all <laughs> have a lot of educating to do. Uh, and we know that your local elected representatives uh, and senators reach out to you. You are their experts. We do what we can. We meet with them. We certainly spend a lot of time with Germain committee members. Um, but your legislators you know, want to, want to hear from you. And so please help us <laughs> educate all the new legislators that we're going to see uh, this next legislative session. Karen's going to talk about the federal funds, still a lot of, um, uh, a lot of eyes on that. We'll keep you posted on the alignment study for the ISAT uh, and discussions about a newer and updated assessment. Uh, we continue to hear lots of, uh, Lots of chatter about a new funding formula. We know there are some bills out there. Uh, and so we will expect that, that will be a topic this next session. I'll use my fabulous crystal ball to tell you that with that many new legislators, the chance that something gets traction and gets passed, probably not. Uh, not very high, but you never know. A lot of times those new folks are drinking from the fire hose and um, <laughs> they, they look to their more experienced colleagues. So again, just help us uh, educate them, weigh in with them and, and help them understand what, uh, what all of this means to you. Education savings accounts, AKA vouchers, whatever you wanna call them. Uh, there was a, another bill introduced in the closing days of the session on ESAs. Uh, that will continue to be a topic, uh, and I think that that just uh, really reinforces that we need to make sure that public education is the number one choice for our parents and our families in the state. Uh, and we certainly, as the superintendent said, we're, we're your biggest cheerleaders. We're always uh, out there advocating for you and doing what we can. Uh, and with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you have.